Hello, beautiful community. We're all in this together. As citizens, we don't get to choose who we share the table of politics with. There is no magical button to press that's the ejection seat that takes us out of having to deal with people we disagree with a lot or are very different to. And there is no magical button we can press that allows us to get away in the medium term with being bad at engaging in conflict constructively in our democracy. In the medium term, if 78.3% of your citizens are bad at engaging in conflict constructively, your democracy is just going to become bare. And the bare democracy is a democracy that is largely reliant on its institutions to keep it afloat. So it's almost the democratic culture melting away, but the skeleton of the institutions remaining until it's worn to a point that it too cannot function. And that often will be something that takes 20 years to you know, materialize in a democracy. Now, being a baby public intellectual, which you are helping me to become better at, right? So I'm moving from being a 12 to a 14 year old public intellectual, means that I do not relate to you like a teacher, right? I'm not your teacher. Well, I can be your teacher if you want, and you can take a consulting hour with me. But I'm not your teacher here. A teacher-student relationship is a much more benignly coercive relationship than our relationship. There is much more benign exercise of power in that relationship than there is in ours. And that's one of the beauties of a public intellectual conversation. Although, of course, teaching is very beautiful too. I just happen to be very bad at it myself because I'm a bad explainer. So it's much easier for me to teach a PhD student than an undergraduate because I'm horrific at teaching somebody transferable skills. Now, what's important is that the gastronomic image here is that you're not coming for a set menu, you're coming to a buffet and I don't control when you come, what you take, in what order, and what you enjoy. And it's very important that that's how our conversation works. And that's a large part of what I call love. Because when I talk about love in the context of the community, I mean that I'm here for you whether you come to the buffet and just take a piece of tofu, or whether you come and have a dessert, or whether you come and mix the tofu together with the dessert and then put it on your head. As long as you don't throw it at somebody else's head, that's fine. Now, there are still things that I can get wrong, however, in the setup of the buffet. And if I put a savory dish in an area that everybody understands there should be a dessert, that still is a, a, a problem, right? Even in this open-ended environment where people take what they want. And that's what I did yesterday. I put some savory dishes in an area that was really for desserts. And I did that by not guiding you through sufficiently what kinds of points I was making and why I was making them. That's the first mistake, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk you th through um, what I should have done instead. I'll just demonstrate uh, that. And the second more minor mistake is that there were really two or three people who were under the impression that it was Alan Lichtman himself. This was a video about Alan Lichtman's keys to the White House. That Alan Lichtman himself was saying that his keys now, in his judgment, favored Trump. And of course, I wasn't saying that. I was saying that his keys favored Trump in my judgment, insofar as they favor anybody. So, what I've got here is a few comments from yesterday's comment section that 
as a result of my um, losing control of the room a little bit um, via misplacing the dishes, um, a, a comment section that got a little bit out of hand. And here's a very important um, democratic point, actually. So probably that comment section is one of the one or two most negative comment sections that have happened under my videos. But it was still preponderantly very positive. But th th there were notable negative comments. And that is out of balance with what you can actually see as a uh, creator behind the scenes because you get shown who's disliked the video and who's liked it. And so that video yesterday got 95% likes. So it's a complete collapse of likes on the chat channel from an average of 98.7 to 99.4 <laughs> to 95. And why is that a democratically important point? Well, because um, it's not just persons, but institutions who experience overreaction, right, to the uh, prominent commentary under a piece of content they share. And the, the way they overreact is that they misanalyze the proportionality, right? So if somebody is saying melons, not watermelons, and all the comments say watermelons, come on, watermelons, come on, there is a tendency to think, oh my word, everybody's for watermelons and the, the melon argument is really struggling here. Um, but that's often an appearance that's not faithful to reality, right? And in an age of polarization, we can often miss that way what sort of more silent majorities think, not just in the YouTube community, but in a country, right? And in my experience, just knowing a little bit of how journalistic institutions work, there is so much defense that is being played. Defensive games are being played because people are feeling under assault, but sometimes more than necessary uh, because the assault looks like it's worse than it is. It's more representative. It looks like it's more representative than it is. And I told you once that um, w w when I participated in this um, Scandinavian public TV uh, uh, program. It was investigation to uh, Nord Stream and Russian disinformation. Um, on one social media channel, uh, this the, the channel of one of these TV stations on a social media platform, just put up a little clip of me, and I <laughs> I read something like a hundred consecutive ne negative comments all saying CIA asset. And, you know, right, there's a risk that you could think, well, hang on, does this, is this like the majority in Denmark? <laughs> you know, whatever. So, no, it isn't, right? So you've got to be clear about that and um, not get frightened. And we've also got to be bold, and go on the offense, not on the defense, when we feel right under the cosh. So enough of a side point on this. Let's come back to what I was trying to do yesterday. So I really broke the video down. And by broke down, I just mean I was lying here, managing some physical symptoms and trying to speak, not having planned anything really. But I broke it down into three sections. I criticized Alan Lichtman's ethics as a public expert. Then I criticized the philosophical foundations of the uh, keys, his keys to the White House, and then I played around with the keys, right? And I didn't explain what the connection was between the first two steps and the third step. And so let's walk through this now briefly. And so if you're interested in my view about Lichtman, you're going to get it now. But if you unsubscribed yesterday because I was critical or you felt unrepresentative of Lichtman, 
uh, you're not going to like this video any more than yesterday. So kindly stay unsubscribed. It's a very important also element of respect on YouTube, right? If you're leaving a channel, it's really respectful to unsubscribe on, on the way out. And I mean that. So I said there were two things I didn't like yesterday about Lichtman as an expert. And now I think there are three. Um, because somebody pointed out to me something that I missed, which was Alan Lichtman's response to um, his recent quarrel with Nate Silver, where he uh, claimed he was offering an olive branch. And here are the three problems with Lichtman uh, uh, as an expert. The first problem is that, um, in his ethics as an expert, the first problem is that he has claimed monopoly of expertise, right, um, on questions where he has expertise, but others do too, right? Um, I've got so many comments yesterday saying, of course, Alan Lichtman was right when he criticized Ned Silva, pointing out he has no credentials and no academic credentials to predict elections because what Nate Silver does is, pre is work with polls and polls are bad at predicting elections, whereas Lichtman's system is good at predicting elections. Now that's a completely insupportable intellectual sort of underpants twister. There's no way you can get away with saying that Nate Silver whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not, has no expertise on anticipating the outcomes of elections. I mean, that is, as I said yesterday, to use a technical term, silly. So don't claim monopoly for your expertise when it takes seven or 77 different kinds of expertise to address an issue, number one. Number two, don't conflate expertise with convergence, right? And I gave the example uh, yesterday of my expertise on the political philosophy of Isaiah Berlin um, and perhaps my relationship with the 10 other people who are an expert on this in the world is one where there'll be some agreement and some disagreement. And of course, if there's disagreement, I'm going to point out what I think they got wrong and why. And I will even be personal about it. You've got this wrong because you're limited in this or that way. You lack imagination and so on. That's all appropriate. But I would never not call them an expert, right? So you've got to be very disciplined about this business of um, challenging people's expertise if it's reasonable to assume that they have expertise, right? So you, you can't do that. Um, and that's connected with a very important sort of um, two cents principle here, which is that experts aren't experts because they get everything right. Experts are experts because they are well placed to get things right. Or because they can get the, when they get things wrong, they they stand they're well placed to get things wrong, in an informative and illuminating way, right? So that, so if you are not an expert on something, and an expert is addressing this issue, the difference isn't that you will always be wrong and the expert will always be right. The difference is that when you are wrong, you've just made a mistake. But when the expert is wrong, they have made a professional mistake. And so the third bit of expertise ethics that is sort of farcically inappropriate with Alan Lichtman is how defensive he is and how self-aggrandizing he is, especially in defense not of an idea but of something that claims to be a model. Experts don't speak like that. Experts don't barricade themselves and um, play defense to rescue a set of claims. They are able to let the set of claims go each morning they wake up. If that's the truthful thing to do. Now, a couple of philosophical remarks which I want to refresh. And I'll be guiding you as I speak about what it is I'm doing with these remarks. 
The first philosophical remark, and this is utterly uncontroversial, I can't think of a major professional philosopher who wouldn't agree with this. Um, and indeed, the uh, philosopher Alan, um, uh, Brian Leiter tweeted this just the other day, that, that um, uh, Lichtman's model is meaningless. So what I say is that Lichtman's model oscillates between vacuity or arbitrariness in a way that can never be properly settled, right? It, it drifts toward vacuity when several reasonable people interpret it. It drifts toward arbitrariness when Lichtman interprets it. second philosophical remark I made about it is that the model is blind to it potentially running out of capacity if it has any capacity to begin with uh, when cultural change occurs, right? So it's a set of shorthand indicators that help us anticipate what might happen in a particular cultural context, but cultural contexts always change. And the question arises, at what point, right, does the model cease to be uh, relevant while it may have been relevant in the past? And what I pointed out yesterday is that some of the um, keys simply partly lapse today, they wouldn't have, the way they wouldn't have lapsed 20 years ago, because of the different political environment and because of the crisis of trust we're living through. So, for instance, the key, which is anyway vacuous, about what constitutes major policy uh, change by um, the White House administration, that key may be may lapse because of the opacity people experience, right, about politics. Um, th that key looks like less of a compelling consideration in 2024 than it would have been in 2004. And so what I have just said aren't, and this is where I failed to guide and where I put the dessert in the um, savory section or the other way around. What I have just said is not that there are flaws with the model. The implication of what I've just said is that there isn't a model, not because the model is bad, but because there are no such models. The model is a model with such a small m, right, that there is no social scientific interest, socially scientific interesting way of calling it a model, right? It's a set of triggers for questions we might ask about whether we, we look one way or another at an upcoming election. So, it's in this context, right, that I invite you, if you encounter the model, uh, to play around with it. Oh, wow, these are very interesting factors uh, that we must think about when we look ahead to an election. Um, let's reflect on them, and maybe they can help guide how we think, not just what's happening, but what's happening, but how we think about what the side that we support can do better. Right. So, what I was in fact saying isn't that I had equal expertise to Lichtman on his model, but that Lichtman's own expertise actually resided in his historical work, in his political work, but not in his model work, because that's not a place to find expertise. Let's now look at a few comments, um, which were in, in good part a product, right, of my misaligning the buffet. And I, I invite us to be very gentle, please, because this is not an opportunity to, to attack people. And I'm actually going to name the commenter. And that's why I particularly invite gentleness. So 
there were quite a few comments like this um, and, and now we're going to we're going to move and looking at them to a slightly different aspect of yesterday's um, talk and the reaction to it and that's my continued claim that this is not quite a 50 50 story at the moment the u.s election because we're still in a situation where my assessment is it leans trump's way i don't need but i need i don't need but i need to say that trump is an anti-democratic authoritarian post-truth populist um buffoon who is a pestilence to U.S. democracy and U.S. democratic institutions, is likely to damage them, is likely to have better skills toward damaging, damaging them in the second term, um, but that they're likely to survive, to survive him sufficiently intact for depending on what happens next for U.S. democracy to perpetuate. So this is a comment from Nancy from Florida. There are three comments. And be gentle on their incongruousness and be gentle on the algorithmic nature of the comments right it's hear this boom react with that hear this react with that that's the algorithmic nature of thought that is imposed on all of us by our current informational environment uh, much health to you vlad but your pivot to the far right has been a major disappointment here is to coming back here on november 6 and celebrating survival for democracy be well. So very well-meaning comment, um, pointing out my pivot to the far right. And I'm just going to lean over across just a little bit here to obscure the posters of Benito Mussolini that I have here. <laughs> um, second comment on the same video from a Nancy from Florida, who has watched a lot of the videos, actually. Nate Silva is on Peter Thiel's payroll. Are you? Third comment. Nancy, Vlad, what is going on with you lately? Is the Republican Party paying you? You seem to be going way above and beyond to justify your prediction of a Trump victory. Um, and then there's a comment from, there's quite a few comments, like there's a comment from Michael. Notice, we're talking about just sort of 5% of the responses. Uh, big time Rush fan Michael, far right propaganda, unsubscribing. So cl it's clear what this is in response to. This is in response to me saying that Trump's got a strong chance of winning and that Trump is charismatic on a playful exploration of Lichtman's keys. And what I did, of course, was go on to play around with Lichtman, Lichtman's keys in the way I invite you to because I don't believe in analyzing them. I don't believe that nobody should analyze them, but I don't believe in analyzing them myself. So, let's stay with these couple of comments for a moment then, because I can see a lot of others. Don't mock these comments. Now, you know that I haven't shifted an inch anywhere, let alone to the far right. Um, and you know that literally nobody is more responsible talking politics on this platform than I am. But we've got to understand that what's expressed in Nancy's comments on a more intense scale is something that you know, affects us all. Almost at the level of a trained nervous system response that algorithms guide us into. You hear two or three combinations of words and you are preparing already a box into which to place what it is that you are seeing. And one of the things that, you know, we're all trying to emphasize to each other is know the difference between what somebody says and what they mean. But I like to put this differently because putting it differently encourages slowness and empathy. 
focus on the difference between what somebody says and what they feel. What is that person feeling? Right? Are they being aggressive? Are they trying to serve themselves? Are they being manipulative? What do they feel? Right? Because the consequence of this algorithmic response that we risk having toward each other that Nancy is expressing here is depersonalization. That's to say, we simply begin treating those who produce certain words as ciphers, not as people. So it's profoundly depersonalizing, and that depersonalization multiplied many times over is in politics kind of dehumanizing. Right? So there's something missing there, not just at the level of effectiveness as citizens, but there's something missing there at the level of how we go on in a civilized society. And when citizens zone out like this, zone out from engaging with the psychological reality of other humans around them, they zone out from everything politically. And they zone out, above all, from having a robust capacity to properly deal with um, democratic pestilences like Trump. <laughs> there is actually somebody online, um, I don't know what they are, maybe they're a comedian, I'm going to give proper credit, and it's it's really trivial and silly, um, but uh, <laughs> they invented a, a tag for Trump that did make me laugh, and that was Mango Mussolini. Now, let's read another comment from without mockery again, from a Joe Holloway, who unsubscribed yesterday, and then resubscribed when I removed the video, but then I pointed out, look, I'm not removing the video because I'm going to be less critical of Lichtman. So, if you're watching, please remain unsubscribed. You're welcome here, but remain unsubscribed. And if you're open to reflecting, then join us in this reflection. We'll read your comment and then react. I did um, uh, I, as an avid view of both your channels and Alan's, found you were out of touch with what Alan's interpretations are. Almost felt like this video was just to stir up controversy. Not an admirable way to get views, especially when the perspective is way of base. Now let's be clear, this channel isn't for getting views. And it's very easy for this channel to get a lot of views. But it's not doing that. Um, and you all know what I need to do to get a lot of views. And I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that because what's important here for me is the process of coming back to the same room and maintaining a, um, a ritual where we're able to reflect and explore. And that's a lifelong commitment. As long as my health allows me to speak, I'm doing it. And therefore, obviously, I'm, I'm getting less views if I'm talking about Alan Lichtman rather than saying something mean about Putin. Um, so this was just one more attempt to return to this room, but with the buffet ill-arranged by me. So let's read... Again, Joe's comment. Um, yeah, felt like the video was there to stir up controversy. Not an admirable way to get news views. Unsubscribed. And this, of course, is it, it, a perfectly legitimate response, but it raises a very important question. What the hell were you doing here before? And, like, what do you now make of your... Um, liking in various ways the content you were engaging with here. Has this experience now falsified your past experience and you retrospectively no longer think you really liked it? Right? 
So what am I driving at here? This is not to be cruel to Joe, it's to be gently cruel to all of us. And this kind of consumerist instinct of shopping for um, our uh, preferred opinions that we prefer to hear. And I said yesterday that in this extremely ill state, I managed to speak to Mark Galeotti. And I actually spoke to Mark about two things. It's going to come up on the main channel. And one was the NATO Russia, Russia war prospects, but the second is the gamification of war and discourse. So the problem is that when I shop for my opinions, when I exchange my time or my subscription somewhere for shopping for opinions, for receiving opinions I want to hear, that is not just undermining of my capacity as a citizen, my capacity to engage in conflict effectively. And it's not just some kind of act of cultural narcissism that a conservative cultural philosopher will write a book critiquing. It's actually not empowering. I don't empower myself when I shop for views. I empower myself when I put myself in an environment that is nourishing to my life goals as a civic entity. What are my life goals? It's to feel good about myself as a citizen. It's to feel effective. It's to be in touch with reality, but not to be too dismayed. And you know, you are on and on. You can go on and, and, and clarify what this consists of. But it ain't empowering to shop. Because it's the shopping that has the power over you when you shop. It's not you who has the power. So there's plenty of good things to shop for. I love shopping for things, right? I love, particularly with my health issue, having exactly the right headphones that meet my needs or whatever. Sure, it's great. But there are some things I don't shop for. I don't shop for um, my wherewithal as a citizen of um, my country. So all of these faults when we see them expressed in a slightly more extreme way, heard an opinion they don't like, unsubscribe. Um, they are at risk of being present in all of us to a lesser degree, right? And that's why it's very important to try to learn from things like this that we might be tempted to, to find a little bit excessive and silly. And the last remark always important is compassion that you don't know what is happening to somebody behind the screen you just don't know you just don't know and that's also an important factor that i try to consider nine times out of ten you can't consider it ten times out of ten it's just not human but i try to consider it um nine times out of ten a very quick health update um i'm going to be it looks like for quite a while not very well less well than I was before. I don't know what that means exactly in practice. Um, I'm continuing to do tests. I'm having some treatments that have been offered. Um, some of the suspected heart damage from long COVID has been confirmed on MRI. Um, I'm having a sense that maybe, because I'm like a professional sports coach when it comes to sensing all these things going wrong in the body, because I've been in the game for 20 years. I have a sense of where things are drifting. And my sense is, that I have on some dimensions been progressively getting gently, little by little worse over the last few weeks. So um, already my capacity has shrunk from two or three hours work a day from home to probably one, one and a half hours every second day. It's always possible to explore um, what you can do, right? what you can produce. There aren't any hard limits, even when there are hard physical limits. There's always an exploration of what you can produce. And I remain more committed than ever to continue content on both channels, including on the main channel. If my health situation sustains in the trend that I'm beginning to observe now, um, I will continue posting on the main channel too. It will just mean that there's some readjustments of how the content there works. So I'm more committed than ever to regularly being here to facilitate the community sometimes well sometimes clumsily like yesterday thank you so much for being with me for so long and lots of love